I wanted to ask you a question that is, uh, all the people above the age of 60 retire from their active work, but uh, how are you able to uh, be so fresh and active uh, all the time? How are you so fresh and energetic and active even at your age? <laughs> You know, I think it's really a function of the mind. If your mind stays young, your body stays young. So it's very important that you keep your mind young. Share a few moments, important moments of this journey, please. You know, I think uh, when I first came on the scene, I was 21 years old and uh, frankly, I'd never been exposed to business. So one went through a fire process for the past first six, seven years. Uh, that was an experience you don't forget because uh, you were overly dependent on trying to learn from other people, overly dependent. You have to be dependent, but you cannot be overly dependent. Uh, I think uh, the other important moment was when we decided what is the social activity we really want to commit to ourselves uh, for the next hundred years. Uh, before we decided that we want to be single-mindedly focused on education and education in school uh, because we found that the process of nation building could be the most leveraged uh, through that. And we have been consistent with that journey for the past 12 years, which Anurag also covered in his introduction. Two major landmarks. How do you see development of a city or any city growth with um, damage to environment or how do we curtail it? You know, the, the, the two most obvious uh, damages which come is uh, diminishing supplies of water, which uh, hurts you on a day-to-day -day life uh, and can choke you on a day-to-day -day life. And the second thing, which is in a way related to environment, uh, but it's not directly related to environment, is availability and non-availability of power. It again hurts you on day-to-day -day life. What is less obvious is, uh, and less hurtful, depending upon your sensitivities, is how uh, friendly your environment is, how many trees are growing, uh, how pure is the air, how much traffic really uh, pollutes the air. I think it's a combination of all these which one has to be sensitive on in any development of any society, and most particularly in development of a large city or a small city. Because if these fundamentals are not taken care of, the downstream effects of it are very serious and can really lead to a very choked life. And if it's a very choked life, you have a very choked development taking place. Mr. Pemji, you, you've talked about a 12-year journey of uh, you know being so more socially responsible than before. Uh, there's talk about the government making CSR spending mandatory. Um, what do you think about that? To, to make CSR mandatory and not be clear in terms of what you expect uh, can unnecessarily create a lot of Mickey Mouse games on it in terms of what you push into it and what you don't push into it. Uh, I'm not very clear in terms of what the real intentions of uh, government are on this. Uh, because those companies which are responsible are doing what they're capable of doing. Hopefully, if they enlarge the scope of what they're expected to do, it will accelerate their efforts. Those companies which are not doing what they're expected to do, it could push them into a statutory requirement and get them to do something. But I hope in the process they don't use short circuits and don't do things which are not as productive as you'd like it to be. Uh, I think the, the ceilings prescribed uh, are large by any standards. And even for the most progressive companies to achieve 2% of their profits into CSR is not going to be easy for the next couple of years. You know, we are doing quite a lot, but the reality is we are not at that level. And, you know, if we compare ourselves with a host of 100 other companies, we are way ahead of them. Uh, so I think people are going to go through a transition. Government must have some flexibility on that transition. Otherwise, it will just encourage people to do dishonest reporting. If Sir wasn't here today, I mean, if he's not in Wipro, where else could, will have he been? <laughs> so you, what, he, what she's asking is that if you were not the chairman of Wipro, what might you have been doing? 
Oh, probably I'd be teaching. Sir, good morning. Being a corporate person, you are extending your business. But what are the factors which are tending you towards the environmental protection? You know, I, I think these are fairly integrated uh, objectives. You know, we don't... Our entire uh, effort in the area of sustainability is also linked to business purpose. You know, we're not trying to divorce one from the other. Uh, as a commercial organization, we have to reduce things to profit and loss. But uh, you'd be surprised that even being very active on sustainability generates higher profits for organizations. Uh, uh, the difference is your time horizons may be different. And some of your yardsticks of how you define the profits may be different. But uh, we, we, our experience is, and we have been quite active now for seven, eight years, that you can reduce it to a fairly strong commercial purpose. And I personally think in a, in a business organization that is important because that's what get rallies of all the stakeholders in the business if things are reduced to a commercial purpose, uh, but with different time horizons. What made you to start this Earthian program? You know, we thought it was a very important uh, rallying point to integrate with uh, all the thrusts which we were giving on education. And uh, as we spelt out right in the beginning, we are taking a very holistic approach to school education. And uh, this is part of that holistic approach. Uh, you, you cannot divorce what's happening in the environment. You can't divorce what's happening uh, across the environment from the concept of education of a young boy and girl. It's a very integrated part of his or her education. And if you were the chairman of a university, how would you make decisions about prioritizing spending? What are the most important things that universities should be investing in right now? You know, let, let, let me give you uh, what philosophy we used in terms of setting up our university. Uh, we set up a university because we were in education. And we found that in India, we produce less qualified teachers properly educated teachers than Finland does. And Finland is 5 million population and we are 1.2 billion population. And uh, we thought that even, we believed, and we are probably correct in that, that even the colleges which were there, were there for form and not for substance. They were not giving any quality education to create teachers uh, of a certain minimum standard of acceptability to be able to be qualified to teach. So we have built a whole charter of our university around that. Uh, and we added to it community development because we think that's very integrated in a village to the process of building a system of education. I think it's a matter of a function of what a university's uh, charter is or what its vision is in terms of what you direct it towards. Uh, I think there are just too many universities which are coming up with a general purpose and therefore are not able to get standards of excellence in any of those purposes. And the university must be set up with a charter of standard of excellence in some areas, and then work towards that. You know, it's different when a university goes to a certain level of maturity and then can afford to broaden itself. But even then, uh, the approach should be that if it is broadening itself, it should at least target to have a standard of excellence in whatever it is broadening itself to. It wouldn't have been easy to put up something that is, you know, this, it's based on such a large scale. So when there, there must have been times where, you know, there were disagreements, there were downfalls. So what was your main motto, I can say, that which kept you going and um, brought it to this level? Yeah, but quite question. honestly, Earthid is a very small organization. I, I wish we had scaled faster than what we have scaled. I mean, what it Hopefully is now. Hopefully, we will scale more as we go into the future. Uh, so, you put, uh, you know, just to get your perspective clear on it, uh, we're, we're doing much less than what we should be doing, and we could be doing much more than what we should be doing. It's a matter of what scale we were able to manage uh, and what resources we are willing to put after it. Uh, I have one more question. Go you know, ahead, I, your question. I, yeah. I, no, you'll get the other question, but let me rephrase your question so that you get a better response. Okay? <laughs> let me rephrase. You could say Wipro is such a large organization, okay. right? And in the past 40 years, he has led it 
from a small vegetable oil making firm to this very large IT services company, right? And there must have been multiple points where there were disagreements, mm -hmm. same kind of things that you talked about. How did you deal with that? Yeah. Right? That is something you can ask. Was that your question? Or has he? <laughs> no, I, my, main, my main point was how did you deal with disagreements, yeah. whether it is in Wipro or in Earthian. So what was your motto behind that? No, I think the simplest thing in dealing with disagreements is get them onto the table. I think uh, nothing, nothing breeds more discomfort and frustration and anger with people if you bottle them up. I mean, that's very fundamental. And you don't always win when you get them onto the table, but at least you come to certain points of uh, understanding which makes for people to move forward. And you know, we, it, to run large leadership positions successfully, uh, you can debate issues, you can get issues onto a table, but what you would expect uh, is that when a decision is made, people fall in line going forward. And if they have strong conviction against the decision made, it's best that they get out of the system and uh, don't frustrate themselves and frustrate other members of their colleagues uh, with their frustration. Uh, my mother works for Wipro and each day, you know, she comes home, she comes with those earthy, um, Wipro books which are made out of recycled paper. So the impression that I get is that Earthian and Wipro are not parallel. So how hard was it for you to combine the two? Because Wipro is an IT company, right? So how hard was it for you to make it mainstream and for you to uh, sort of induce it into every, uh, maybe not every employee, but uh, most of the majority that this is what our aim is and it would be nice if you would join us. So how, how hard was that? Or was it hard? You ask very complex <laughs> questions now. <laughs> Just simplify that, please. Okay, how, how hard was it for you to, uh, or was it hard for you to uh, make Earthian and Wipro an IT company and something which deals with the social cause to make it mainstream, like to merge it? How hard was it? No, I don't think that is hard. I mean, yeah. It just requires to put priorities onto it. That's what is fundamental. Uh, most things are not hard. It's important that you get priority onto it and put the right best people behind it. And you give adequate en enough resources, not too much resources, but adequate enough resources to get it moving forward. And where you find you don't have competence, you leverage talents of partners who have that competence or who have that reach. Uh, we have been doing that consistently using partners and where we find we have to train them, or where we find we're going to have partners interacting among themselves to train themselves to uplift their standards. We do that with some amount of sophistication and maturity, which I think has become quite distinctive with us. The Bipuro, which has started a, a fantastic university, is going to fulfill this gap or the lacuna. The value-based education, which is very important, at this juncture where the whole society is moving in a very, you know, materialistic way. I would like to ask the chairman, Mr. Premji, how he has worked to address this. You know, what you must appreciate uh, is we can play a role. Uh, and uh, the more successful we are, the more important that role becomes. But the whole formation of values of society or values of individuals are a, a complex of multiple forces which operate on that person. Uh, I think the most important force is uh, his family, uh, his parents, and uh, his elder sister and his elder brother. Uh, if that fundamental is strongly in place, and hopefully with the work which we do, the next generation will have some of that in place at least in some pockets which we are really focusing, in parts of the country where we are focusing, I think a lot of the groundwork for that has been laid. Uh, in, 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 uh, in terms of what we are doing, in terms of our initiatives in education, whether it be at the university or whether it be at the schools, uh, we consider building the character of the child or character of the individuals a very important part of what we do. Uh, and it's very fundamental to what we do. But if, if the influences on him or her keep pulling in different directions, 
uh, we get a very watered down version of what we do, which is unfortunate, but we still get a version which is better than what we started with. So at least there's some amount of satisfaction that comes through that. How do you see the service sector is going to survive in future? Whether there would be two division, that one division would constitute of product development and other would continue to provide service? Or uh, is it harmful or beneficial for India to be overly dependent on service sector? You know, the service sector growth then as a percentage of the GDP of the country is, uh, is uniform across all emerged countries or developed countries and it's happening across emerging countries. Uh, there are some countries like China which have a very high domination of manufacturing and a low domination of services. But if you take across the board, India is, interestingly has a service sector component which is about 58%, which is equal to a fairly developed nation. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it has come at the displacement of manufacturing. Uh, so, a share of, of the GDP which could have gone to manufacturing has not gone. And it is because of the default of manufacturing in terms of its depth and penetration in the country. Uh, I think the service sector's good thing is that uh, it's very employment generating. Uh, and that is important in our country is that we do give thrust to areas which are employment generating. The second important thing is that you know, what you saw happening to manufacturing 20 years back in terms of its globalization is now very actively happening to services. Uh, and because it is happening to services, uh, the globalization across the world is generating more accelerated growth in services in emerging countries because they bring a natural uh, advantage of younger talent, they bring a natural advantage of cheaper talent or less expensive talent and the bigger natural advantage of the majority of emerging countries have placed a much higher emphasis on science and engineering than the more westernized countries because the job options there have been much more. And as a result, young students have decided that they don't want to be in science or education, in science or engineering as compared to younger nations where job opportunities are much less and therefore, there's a lot of parental guidance and parental encouragement and societal encouragement to go into science and engineering. So I think overall, it's a good foundation to build on, uh, but it is also a foundation in which you should have some balance. Uh, and I think the balance India requires is more depth on manufacturing. We're excessively dependent on imports. So has this kind of power and authority in any uh, part of your life uh, harmed you? Lovely, very nice question. What he's saying is, yeah, with so much of power and authority, has your power and authority ever harmed you or harmed? Very nice. You know, one, one, uh, one advantage which I have is that uh, power has not been my objective. Uh, so it's not gone to my head yet. The message or the motivation you want to give to us, the students, Generation Y. No, you, you're asking is uh, what should really motivate you? Yeah. You know, I think that's a very personal question of what should really motivate you. I think uh, the longest sustaining thing which should really motivate you is that something in which you're trying to quest for something to satisfy yourself uh, and feel good about yourself. Uh, and uh, decide what that is uh, and, and be constant to that purpose and try to work for excellence in that area. And don't get too worried about what other people think of you all the time. I wanted to ask you that what inspired you or was it just your determination that took you uh, from making just this ordinary oil making company to a software? You know, I think eventually it becomes a race with yourself, you know, what really uh, are the standards you set for yourself. And I have a very simple philosophy that whatever I try to do, I try to do to a measure of excellence which satisfies me. Uh, and that's been my major motivation in terms of moving forward. Hard work is the key to success. 
and you know that and we all know that you have worked hard to make Wipro flourish like anything so can you share the hard works which you have done and can you please tell that who is the role model in your life and what all and what else you have learned from them and can you just tell me something about them you know I think you have to have, in terms of an approach, enough modesty to realize that there are many, many smart people in this world. Uh, so I'm and asking. one major advantage, if you work harder, is you have a distinctive advantage over the other very smart people. I've learned that in life, that uh, you can outwork a lot of people who tend to be even smarter than you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You know, it's very difficult to define role models who are a general purpose across what you are. I try to pick them in areas where I think there's something to be followed with. Uh, so there would be many, many people who could become role models for various aspects of your life and various phases of your life. So can you mention any one? I think the work that Gandhi did uh, in terms of nation building and the leadership he gave was probably the one who stood out the most. Sir, will you please share your experience of turning points in your lives? You know, I, I think I had the advantage of having a, a mother who was quite exceptional uh, and who set a lot of standards and a lot of uh, examples to the family. Uh, and she did it really through selfless effort. And though she was a doctor, she never practiced medicine, but set up uh, the earliest hospital for polio and crippled children in Mumbai and devoted her life right up to almost the age of 75 towards it as a chairperson. And, uh, you know, that was a constant turning point uh, in your life. It was not just a one turning point in your life because uh, she was constantly setting examples. Humans are born or cursed to the earth. But why do you raise the question like that? That's very interesting. No, many people say the humans are the most intelligent species in the earth, and many of them say they're acting, um, to say, they're capturing all the resources, they're not sharing with the other species. So I want to know your opinion about humans. But look at it this way, you know, there are many worse people than us on earth. <laughs> <laughs> because we are the one we are depleting the earth, so I want to know. Don't think of it that way, otherwise you'll sit, sit and self-depress yourself. If Indian, Indian education is in the right way, are the, what are the preventions to prevent it? Is the Indian education fine and how do you yeah. improve it? That's what you're asking, right? Yes. If you look at uh, primary education, I think it requires a lot to be done. Uh, both in private schools and in public schools, because unfortunately it has been very patterned on rote learning. And therefore has made the learning of uh, a young student very, very uh, boxed in and very, very limited. And I think that's the biggest thing which evolves into what you do when you go forward. But we also have education in some of the higher institutes, the more advanced institutes, which are world class. Uh, but generally, if you talk about education in India, it's an area which has not got a standard of excellence. and. Uh, uh, there are very few institutes which really stand out with that standard of excellence. 